I'm like, there's going to be a cow flying by like the window, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, good. Oh, that's good. Okay. You're in the, the, the sunshine is the eye of the storm. <laughs> The sunshine is a false advertising cell to get you to move here. I'll put it that way, but. <laughs> nice, nice. I traveled around America when I was 18 and I spent, um, I was like really like had no cash basically. And I was in Key West and I, oh, I, yeah. I basically slept on Key West for on the beach for four nights. And um, they had one of the biggest um, hurricanes on the way at the time. And I've never, I've never been stuck in rain and a storm like that before. I was there with, there was three other guys. We were all just sleeping on the beach and the storm came in and it was like the most ridiculous storm you've ever seen. And the only <laughs> place we could hide was like in these public toilets, but they had closed the public toilets because they shut them the security gates at night. So we were like, we had like this much room like between the security <laughs> gates and the roof. And it was just like, oh, it was shocking. The storms there are crazy. <laughs> My goodness. I bet you have a lot of empathy for homeless people. Now. Yeah, well, actually, we met a lot of homeless people when we were there because they were also sleeping on the beach and stuff. And it was actually quite, it was quite like nice speaking to them. They, they had some great stories and they actually helped us out and these sort of things. So, yeah, you have a lot of um, empathy for them, that's for sure. Beautiful. We are here with Sarah Kirikoni, the live free warrior in her new abode. Thanks so much for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for such an intro. <laughs> awesome. We're excited too. We had a, a little joke before you had the most amazing coffee mug ever and we had a good laugh about it. Like we all love these big coffee mugs and you've got this amazing one with a cool saying on it and maybe you want to tell us about it. Well, it has, there's a funny story behind it and it has own your weird logo on it, which is part of my, uh, from my book, living cancer free. The, I put the logo on when I originally did it by design and it was upside down. So it came in and I'm like, well, I don't know if I want to flip it or if I want to keep it. And I was like, no, it's, it's weird. And it's supposed to be weird. And I'm just going to rock it. That's the way it's meant to be. So yeah, the own your is upside down along with the logo, but the weird is the only part that's right side up. So I think it's the weird that's the normal part. Hmm. And uh, I usually cheers to my cup of weird in the morning. So I love drink it. up. <laughs> it's actually really cool. It's cool. It almost seems intentional. You know what I mean? Like that yeah. you've done it that way. It's really cool. <laughs> that's what I meant to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it worked because it stuck with me and I was like, you know, that's, that's, that's a cool thing actually. And embracing your weird, you know, which is, which I'd never really thought of like, you know, before. So it's kind of cool, cool idea that. Thank uh, you. So we can get into that later. That's a later uh, in life lesson that we can delve into. hundred percent. Yeah. So Sarah, you had a pretty comfortable and pleasant childhood by all accounts uh, with your brother and parents in Stratford, um, which was just sort of small town. What was day to day like for you as a young girl uh, living in a small town like that? I mean, it's, it's one of those places where you wake up and then you you have your house and you have your yard and you would go to school I mean aside from the first day of kindergarten where the bus didn't pick me up and I was like the oddball out my parents had to drop me off it, it was really normal and natural I moved schools a couple times but grew up really vanilla you know I had great parents I played sports um, I've always been active um, even I mean to this day I'm Still playing sports but uh really you know I ate pop tarts I played in the yard I had a go-kart that my dad and I used nice. to ride it was really a, a, I would say boring but it was probably about as normal as I was for my, my entire life <laughs> <laughs> and but you, your parents owned a ski shop if that's right correct they have have had they still have a uh, ski and snowboard store in Stratford, which is a small town. So, I mean, I would spend, while some kids are having the weekend, we were at the store and we were all working together. So I learned from a young age about entrepreneurship, about um, the values of hard work. Uh, for better or worse, I learned that you got to work some weekends. Um, and I, I still do to this day. But yeah, we were always together, uh, doing things together, working together. I was pretty much, aside from school and spare time, I was there at the ski shop. 
I grew up skiing since I was two and a half. I learned on a golf course and uh, <laughs> I don't ski anymore in Miami. Thank you. But uh, I'm not bad. I'm pretty good. I'm a really good skier, actually. Uh, one of those useless skills that I no longer use. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine when you start that young, you can, you're like, you only can be good. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's amazing. It's amazing when you go on the slopes and you see, you, when you're talking about skiing, we're talking about uh, snow skiing, I'm assuming, eh? Yes. Yeah, yes, cool, yes. cool. Um, so yeah, you just see these little kids on the slopes and they're just fearless. You're like, whoa, <laughs> what are you doing? It's just incredible. <laughs> and it's so cute as well. Like they have these, they're like all, when they're really small, like that age, three years old or whatever it is, like they're on these little trains that follow the, and they all hold hands and they like kind of go down in this little snake down the mountain. It's, I always thought it's so cute because they've got these big puffy jackets and they're tiny little things. So it's, yeah, it's such a cute thing to see, actually. <laughs> they make the little pizza wedges with the, yeah. the skis. The legs are shaking. <laughs> yeah, the arms are flailing everywhere. Yeah, yeah exactly. The arms are out here. Yeah, it's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you mentioned that entrepreneurial sort of side. Um, you also used to like sell these bubblegum balls at, at, the, at that store and then sort of split it with your, with your granddad and your brother. Um, is that where you sort of things started, you know, your entrepreneurial sort of journey? Yeah, you, you grow up around people building their own business and you have that instilled within you that if you want a dream to happen, you put in the hard work, you keep with the vision, you find a way to make a buck uh, no matter where it comes, how it comes, and the value behind that. Those are, again, like skiing. Those are lessons that you learn at a young age that can never leave you that are invaluable for the rest of your life. Maybe the skiing one isn't as valuable, but <laughs> learning the lessons of entrepreneurship for business and later in life. I mean, it's, it streams through any one of the client meetings that I have through any of the pitches I do. Um, even writing my own book, it's, it's how you're approaching the hard work to get to the end goal. And it's, it's about making that connection with people as well. Mm. And uh, like you, you, obviously that was with your granddad. Did you have a close relationship with your grandparents? He was, he was my closest. He was really the special one. Uh, my grandfather on my dad's side who started the skiing store. store. Well, at the time it was just a ski store, but mm -hmm. our relationship was the closest. I was the, the little girl. Um, my grandmother used to joke that I was wrapped around his little pinky finger mm -hmm. that when you're the granddaughter, you're the only granddaughter, you can kind of get away with whatever you want and ask for whatever you want. <laughs> totally. But yeah, that was a really special relationship that we had. Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. And you also mentioned that you have a, you know, you had a feeling of needing to, to please other people. Uh, where do you kind of feel that that stemmed from? I think that was more in my teenage years where I started to, it, it, it probably started when I was younger too, where you want to be liked by people. This is pre-social media, but it's kind of the same, same thing. Uh, you want to be liked by people. So when you're in elementary school, how do you get people to like you? You want to be part of the cool crowd. You want to be admired by others. And in elementary to middle school, and of course, into high school, that's where it really started to, uh, it really started to take form. And Maybe it's not necessarily because to this day, I'm not a pleaser. If I have something to say, I say it outright and upfront and I'm not about pleasing people. I'm more so about speaking my mind and finding the best solution. That's the nice way of saying it. It doesn't always come out that way. But when I was younger, it was more about being liked than it was about pleasing others. Uh, mm. And I think that's something a lot of people, even adults, can um, connect with. Yeah, I it's think so a lot true. of people fall into that kind of trap, especially like these days. We kind of, we do, we, we, we do what we think other people think we should be doing, you know, like, uh, because we may be scared of what they'll think if we do something else. And it's, it's not a cool place to be in, I don't think. No, and you said um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, I was doing my math. Six letter word that I absolutely, absolutely cannot stand <laughs> and it should. Should, should. Yeah. The shoulds will kill you in life. It really takes away any freedom whatsoever. Yeah, that's very true. Can, can you just explain that a little bit more? Like, how do you mean with that? With, um, sure, with should, shoulding and have to, it's actually a part that I write in the book. And it's when someone says you should, 
or someone says you have to, as a human response, we'll say no, and we'll automatically put up a blockade, a defense, because we don't want to be told what to do. Yet, the shoulds we put in our own head, mm -hmm. I should do this because that's the part that takes away, do I really want to do this? For example, I am 35. I should have kids and own my own house by now. But who's mm -hmm. saying that? First of all, I don't want kids. Second of all, we're not going to have mm -hmm. kids. Second of, uh, third of all, <laughs> I really <laughs> don't want to own. I have a hurricane coming in Miami. Like why? Then you have to worry about all those things that come with it. So yeah. there's choice. It takes away choice. Shoulding takes away choice from what you actually want to be doing. And when you put the shoulds and the have tos aside and you create your own list of how you want to live your life, then you move into more of a, a freedom zone rather than a shoulding, I think is the best way to, easiest way to put it. <laughs> yeah, well put, that, yeah. that internal dialogue is so important, you know, like, like what people say to themselves every single day. And like you just said, that should is definitely one of those. How, how do you kind of, or what do you sort of suggest to people to use instead of should or have to and that sort of stuff? Choose uh, and mm -hmm. want. Choose and want or opportunity. It really depends on the sentence. Mm. But using I choose to means that you're empowering yourself. I want to means that you're taking responsibility or I have the opportunity to takes it out of something that's maybe negative and puts it into more positive. It depends on the, the context, but those mm. would be the words that I would um, suggest. Yeah, yeah, it's always much, much better choices. Those are empowering uh, words to use rather than disempowering or unempowering. Yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. yeah it's amazing. Like the, those words, like not not maybe the shoulds or whatever, or but maybe the shoulds. Like uh, they they kind of put up barriers straight away. You know what I mean for people, and they kind of uh, yeah. This is the subconscious programming that they're telling themselves these things every single day. So they never actually end up achieving stuff because they just you know creating barriers for themselves through what the story that they're telling themselves. So I think it's, it's something that people definitely don't take enough notice about, you know, because, um, yeah, it literally is something you're doing every single day. And, um, you know, if you can change it, then, then you should change it. So, um, things were not getting any easier in your life, like at the stage, um, um, so I'm so sorry, actually, I missed the part. Yeah. So slowly but surely, you felt disconnected between the person you were and the one that you should be. Um, this is where your struggle with food actually uh, began and ultimately your eating, orders, uh, eating disorder started, didn't they? Correct. And I mean, it really came to fruition when I was in high school. I, I was younger than most of the group that I was in for my, my grade range. And regardless of age, even to this day, I'm more of a kid at heart than I am the adult. I mean, if you see the outfits I wear every day, I'm happier in fitness clothes. I'm happier in shorts and flip flops. That's why I live where I do. Then I, I will never be the person wearing the pencil skirt with the button up blouse. I knew that from an early, early time that that would never be me. Uh, when I was in high school, that's when I started to feel like I still wanted to be that girl in middle school who was playing gymnastics in the basement or really into her sports. And it was still okay to do well in school. When I started to hit high school, people around me, uh, and just in general, people in high school, they wanted to go out, they wanted to drink, they wanted to stay out late, they wanted to be a smart ass in school. And that's where I started to feel like I had to change who I was in order to still fit in, mm. which I never did. I never did. And even to this day, I don't fit in anywhere, yet I really feel like I fit in everywhere, like uh, in a good way today, though. Uh, and I'll go back to that. But in high school, that's where I really started to feel that rift of this is who I am, but I'm not accepted as who I am. So this is where I need to be in order to be accepted, which is a false impression anyway. That's all BS. What I was sharing before um, and going back to what I was saying, it's I don't fit in anywhere yet. I feel I fit in everywhere. I think that's the awesome part of travel because I don't have to. 
I mm. can continuously learn from the people surroundings wherever I am. I can go to a business traveler conference and show up and talk about business, entrepreneurship, freaking flying. And then I can go to a yoga studio and talk about Upward Dog and the, the Pranavayus and I can talk about whatever. I can go to a production set and be mirroring what the art direction is like. So it's, in a way, it's cool to have multifaceted talents, interests, and ability to chameleonize yourself, yet at the same time feel comfortable that that's just me. And it's a, it's a very, very different place and feeling than when I had in high school. How were you feeling like, like with you, with yourself in high school, you know, like were you just sort of not liking yourself or what was the feelings you had? Imagine being, uh, in that, we're, so we were talking about kids skiing earlier. Imagine being a little kid skiing with that giant jacket that was four sizes too big for him or her. Or on the opposite, imagine being an adult wearing a kid sized jacket. You just felt like you had this, I felt like I had this skin on, this body, this environment around me that I didn't know, it didn't fit right, it didn't feel right. And that's how I felt in myself for a, a very long time. And were you talking to anyone about it? Like your folks, friends, or did you feel comfortable doing that? No, no. Uh, I don't think at that age, you really talk to mom or dad about anything except, can you drop me off at the mall, mom, please? <laughs> my friends. And then you like yell at your dad because you're so not fair, dad. Um, <laughs> I never talked like that. I really, I, I never had like that stupid, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you say. <laughs> yeah, 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 come on. Well, I did it. I promise. Parents, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask him. I was a pain in the butt. That is for sure. I was not the easiest child. Uh, I wasn't the worst child, but I wasn't the easiest. And I was always stubborn as hell. And when I wanted to do something, it was just, even to this day, if I wanted to do something, it's just headstrong going to do it. But that's where I really felt a big, big disconnect when I was younger. Yeah. And, and off the back of that disconnect, is that kind of like what led to say anorexia? These these have been given names now, but obviously there's like a spectrum, and and I suppose you had this feeling inside, and and I'm trying to understand like how the transition happens to becoming a let's say a more formalized issue, if you know what I mean. Sure. When you're not connected with your body and you're trying to change it, you're trying to make it into something. You're trying to reposition how that jacket fits on you. The easiest way to, you start looking for a, what can I control? What can I take charge of? Well, like, I can't control the people around me. I can't control what my parents let me do or not let me do. And the one thing that I could control was food. And I knew that food was one thing I can say yes or no to. And it's something that I was ingesting. So I started to really focus on food and body image and how I looked. I wanted to change what that jacket felt like. And mm -hmm. uh, the one thing I could control around that was what I was eating. That's where I really started to slowly taper off how much I was eating. And mm -hmm. I started to eat less and less and less. And that's what initially provoked the eating disorder. And it started as anorexia. And it became a point where I... Stop focusing so much on sports. Um, I was playing softball and volleyball at the time. And when I was at a camp for volleyball over the summer, right before the school year began, I was really, really thin. I was very, very thin. And uh, my coach at the time was concerned. And then one time when I almost passed out while playing in the school year, uh, it was really, it wasn't an ultimatum, but it was pretty much gain weight or you're not going to play. So I kind of mm. said, well, this, and I'm not going to play then. So mm. I'm not going to give this up. This is finally how I learned to control my life. There's no way. And that's when I dropped sports. And that's where I really, really delved heavily into an eating disorder, which later transformed. There's only so much you can starve the body before you really start to need food. So that transformed into bulimia after. And, it, and with any addictions, with addictions in general, and that's where alcoholism came in later, you swap one for the other sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so it was playing this awful dance going back and forth between the two. And 
maybe like what, what, what is going through your mind when you, when you have to eat and you're in the thick of an eating disorder, like it was, especially with anorexia, I suppose, like, are you, I suppose there's so many emotions going on every time because it's a, it's a very conscious thing. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, thinking back to that time, especially mm. it was, it was trying to figure out how do I get out of this? It's a lot of anxiety on top of anxiety that gets brought up because the reason you're struggling in the first place is in part anxiety, but then you're also forced to do something you don't want to that you fear. So it creates a double layer of anxiety on top of it. Uh, I remember that quite often where I was trying to figure out how to get out of or how I can say no to making up, you come up with this long list of excuses as to why you don't need to eat with somebody or why you want to say no thanks. Um, I remember doing a lot of that with some of my friends. All of a sudden you start crossing yourself out of some of the activities. So it's a very isolative, uh, yeah, isolative um, disorder. Yeah. And, and, but did, did, did people start noticing or did they start noticing and, and saying stuff like your folks or your friends and things? For sure. For sure. And that's where, that's when you start raising some eyebrows. And sometimes you look for that. You want people to, you do what you don't. And it's this really twisted mindset. You're calling for help mm. no matter what disorder you have psychological disorder because it's a mental issue you're calling for help if you're someone who is you know even an even an alcoholic even someone who is a cutter even someone with an eating disorder any one of the addictions you're calling for help in an outside way that you don't know how to voice so you're looking for that attention but at the same time you don't want to give this up so you will almost push it away because it becomes your safety it's really and it's not safe but it's a it becomes your coping mechanism hmm. such a yeah such a challenging thing to to understand and to deal with if you're in it and to deal with if you're not in it and you see somebody else that's, that's struggling with it it's just like very complex actually mm -hmm. yeah. it is and it's um to this day even when i am running and i see people if i'm at the gym and i see people you, if you've been there and you've walked the path, you intuitively sometimes know. I never mm. judge and I mm. never outright say like, oh, that's an anorexic over there. Mm. But you intuitively know something is up. It's not something you can really approach somebody and start talking about. It's not like, hey, how's the weather? By the way, are you anorexic? It's mm. you, in a way, I offer compassion to people just like, giving a smile or saying hi, if somebody wants to open up, I'm always happy to talk or share, but it's not really table conversation for lack of a better phrase. Yeah, it's so true. <laughs> and like, what are the, like the emotions involved? Like, are you, I mean, are you um, hard on yourself? Are you sort of some self hatred or is there, um, or are you feeling like empowered? Maybe I, I'm not sure. Like what are the, or, or a mix of all of these, what are the kind of emotions that you sort of dealing with back then or yeah, like back then in the, when you're in the thick of it, you feel in a lot of ways, you feel powerless. Uh, you deep, if you're honest with yourself, you feel powerless, but if you are playing into the eating disorder, you feel powerful. It feels powerful in that moment to say, no, I'm not going to eat this. And nope, I can have whatever, uh, 500 calories today. I don't need this. Um, but you can also feel powerless because when it, you know, deep down, it's not okay. There's nothing okay with it, but you can't overcome it. Um, later I did, but in the moment you can't overcome it. So it's really, that's when I keep going back to, it's this huge separation. Your mind knows this is not okay your body's telling you yet your your mind starts to override it because it's mm. the choice that you're making it's your control and now your relationship with food now it's good i mean i'm assuming well i haven't eaten in three days no i'm just kidding i just had lunch <laughs> <laughs> it's um i always have to break 
like darker moments with comic relief. That's just Sarah's <laughs> way of I bring it back up to light. No, I have been really, really, I've done the work. So it's not that it comes easy, but I've really overcome a lot of the struggles with food. And now it's food is energy. Food is taste. Food is what do I enjoy? Food is what is fresh? What do I need? How do I need to feel? Um, it's no longer about how many calories, how many fat grams, how many, it's what am I feeling when I eat this? How do I want to feel later? And am I enjoying it? Um, I do a lot more cooking now for myself. My husband and I do a lot of cooking, which I enjoy because it's, you're putting the energy and love into your own food. Um, when I travel, I love to try some of the other fruits and veggies. If it's local and fresh, then I like to do some of the fishes. I don't do a lot of meat. Um, I've done the whole vegan and vegetarian thing for a, a couple years. And I moved, I always had that, um, I always checked in with myself to say, is this because of choice? Is this because of how I'm feeling? Or am I choosing to cut out food groups? And it was always, I was always checking myself to say, no, this is because this is how I want to feel. And so that was very important for me not to get into the labels again. So now when people ask me, oh, you're a yogi, you must be one of those vegans. And I was like, no, I'm just flexitarian. They're like, that's flexitarian. not a food group. And I'm like, it certainly is. And it is for me. So it goes back to the weird category. Uh, yeah. I, I was wondering, so someone that's dealt with anorexia, right? Would, would, do you ever fast or like as a, let's say now you're in a much better space and all that. Is that, can that be like triggering for you or do you just leave it alone or, or do you still like, well, that's, I'm, you're totally cool with it now. you you would fast in terms of a health sort of a, in, from a health aspect. I'm going to say I've never done a fast before. Um, mm. If I were to, it would be from a health perspective. Um, but I know I don't, I don't do fasting now. If, if I'm speaking to somebody and they are asking me, I would suggest be sure that you're doing it for health reasons and not falling back mm -hmm. into an excuse. It's easy yeah. to buy into our own excuses when it comes to food in, in any capacity that you can make any reason or rationale up for why you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not something I don't feel the need to. I mean, the closest that I do to fasting is sometimes I won't um, have breakfast and I'll mm. jump into the first meal of the day. Just, but it's not a, sometimes I feel like it's more energy. If I wake up and I'm starving, I'm not going to not eat. Um, totally. But that's really, it's just, it's a constant what's going on inside my head and you become very self-aware uh, of why you're making choices and over time those choices start to become your habits so you really just retrain yourself with your habits mm. yeah for sure yeah it's a short it's a, it's a long process that i can only imagine um getting from where you were to to where you are now it's a, it's a it's a great transformation so going back to to the story you mentioned alcohol and actually alcohol became quite a big part of your life then too. Um, what was it that you sought out in alcohol? <laughs> the escape from the eating disorder, the escape from my mind, the escape from the world, pressures, the shoulds, going back to the shoulds, it was an escape. And I do really believe that's what a lot of people use alcohol for today too, mm -hmm. or any addiction or any kind of, um, I'll say drug, but when I say drug, I use it loosely. It's the same, having three drinks just to forget your day is the same as going on Facebook for an hour and zoning out. Uh, you doing checkouts, like different ways to check out of your own life because you don't want to think, you don't want to feel, you don't want to deal. That's really what alcohol did for me. Mm. And was, it like, was it like serious addiction or was it just, you know, like a few here and there? I don't think waking up Monday through Saturday, drinking first thing in the morning to stay off the hangovers is normal. So I'm going to go with, yeah, it was a problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a yes. bottle of whiskey. Wow. It's crazy. I was a so, big so vodka drinker. Yeah. Big vodka. Wow. No wow. ways. That's crazy. Yes. And, and so would you still have hangovers? Like I know I always wonder if you drink a lot or regularly, like do you still get the bad hangovers? To this day? No, I mean at the time, you know, like you've, You've, you, you're kind of drinking fit, let's say, very drinking fit. And, um, and, and so, like, do you still wake up every day with a hangover then if you're drinking every day? 
it was a way to avoid it um, so you didn't feel. Uh -huh. uh, so in those days, no. But the day or two or three that I didn't, because I, I was uh -huh. in school and um, had to do work, but I would, uh, that's where I would fall back into the eating disorder. It would just uh -huh. go back into an eating disorder. So you, uh -huh. you swap one for the other. Oh, you goodness. don't want to feel, so how do you still function but not feel? And you choose a different drug, a different mm. alcohol, a different disorder. That's crazy. Like, like you said earlier, you know, so many people do these kinds of things, maybe don't even realize, like you'll need like a few coffees in the morning and then you might have a sleeping pill at night or a drink and, and you, you have these ways of like just getting your body feeling better instead of like, getting into your own head and your mind and your body and just like connecting with it. It's, it's pretty, um, like you said, there's a whole s sort of spectrum of, of different ways of having a very similar experience to what you had. Agree. Agree. And I think as there's more, there's more vices today than ever for you to mm. check out. And I think in a way that that can be alarming and something for us as a society to just take note on that, how we need to start tuning in to ourselves more and tuning out to the outside um, ways that we can really just disconnect. Mm. I think that that's more than parents being, if I can offer anything more than parents being paranoid about their kids being on social media, like learn the ways that they're connecting and, and it's a new way of connecting, but being mindful of what they're connecting with. Uh, and I think that that will be more and more prevalent moving forward, how, how teens are growing up, what they're, what they're filtering into their minds with. Yeah. Kind of feels like a bit of an experimental phase we're going through and we don't quite know what's going to turn out at the end. Um, just, just talking about connection there, like what was your connection with the outside world like then your, um, say your network, friends, family, like what, you know, you're, you're drinking most of the time or you, you know, you're not eating. Like what was that connection like or lack of it? That was more in college when I started to drink like that. Um, I still tried to drink when I was in high school. I was, I had the worst luck in the world when it came to getting caught with alcohol. Like it was really the world <laughs> telling me, just stop there, really. Um, but what it was, that was more when I was in college and I didn't have that much of a social life. I'm an introvert by nature. I love to get out in crowds and talk with people, motivational speaking, um, you know, when I do some events, but then I also need to pull off and regroup my energy. I'm very much an empath. So I need to also keep certain energy barriers up for how much I'm letting out. Uh, but back then it was really, I didn't socialize that much with people in school because you, you can't have too much of a social life if you have an eating disorder or you want to drink to the extent that you were. There were, I had some friends and they knew it was probably not good what Sarah was doing. They didn't know to the extent that I was drinking because it would be like, let's go out on the weekends, which in college, I think that's fairly normal, we'll say. But uh, the extent of how it continued to the next day wasn't normal. That part wasn't normal at all. So mm -hmm. once or twice, people would say something to me, but it's, it's like the eating disorder. You can, you can but... The person's certainly not going to listen because they're not ready. And I wasn't ready. You know, it's fascinating just hearing you say that in a way. I was just thinking like you, the people say it's not normal, right? What you were doing, but it's normal to binge drink on the weekend. Do you know what I mean? Like there's a double standard there somewhere as well. Like w which one is normal? Like neither of them are really normal if you really take a moment to think about it. But yet people would judge you in some way because they would binge drink on the weekend, but not on Monday. That's, you know, that's not okay. <laughs> I agree with you. Agree. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> that's the way <laughs> things a work. A lot of double standards in the world. Absolutely. And people yeah. can be very quick to judge others because mm -hmm. it's a projection of themselves. Um, that hmm. happened once or twice, but with most people, they had legit, Hey, Sarah, not when, you, when, when are you going to cut this out? Yeah, fair enough. And and so talking about, you know, cutting this out, you later on your journey you 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 um you did give it up, right? And
but but it sort of was through a process of your understanding why you were doing that if i'm understanding correctly so so can you maybe just explain sort of that process sure the whenever you want to make change it's really important to know the why and i really emphasize that to people that i'm either coaching or speaking know your why and then you can start to build new foundations and building blocks if you know why you're doing something if you know why you want to change then you're going to keep reaching for that why you want to change and rebuild the why you're doing it um, at that time i was trying to escape from a lot of things i didn't want to like i said i didn't want to deal with it i didn't want to talk about it i didn't want to grab a handle on my life when i was with um my now ex-husband but we were dating at the time and it reached a point we had fun and we went out on the weekends but it reached a point where it was not fun anymore where sarah started to forget what happened um i would you know really black out too often uh mm. and it became a when is this gonna stop and when i started to get more serious with him I knew I wanted to create a better life for myself and in turn for us at the time. Mm -hmm. That was my why. That was my why, why I wanted to change. So I started to cut out the drinking slowly. Um, there were still a couple times where I drank too much and then it put mm -hmm. me right back to where I was. But it was really a decision that I made in that moment. And like I said before, when I make a decision with something or I'm determined with something, it's really all steam ahead, full steam ahead, and I just go for it. So it doesn't work that way for, for everybody, for majority of people to just stop drinking. For me, it did uh, because I was really focused on the why. And I think that's why to this day, I can have a glass of vodka and I stop after one. Um, when you start to really heal the deeper wounds below, you can create a better relationship so that it doesn't become a vice. It just becomes a thing once again, as it's, as it's meant to be, um, for that reason. And that's probably for another long conversation, but I don't really believe in all or nothing when it comes to drinking. Uh, I never went to AA, but I don't really believe that you have to abstain in order to, to deal. If you go deeper, I believe, then you can start to really create a better relationship. I took that from food too, because if you start to develop a better relationship with food, it's not cutting it out altogether. That goes right back to the eating disorder. So you have to create a better relationship, understanding the why. And I applied the same strategy with alcoholism as well to create a better relationship with it, to create balance, to create an understanding. But do you really think that that is like, is true? If, if you think of, of everyone in the world, like there's so many people that are not maybe as, strong as you let's say you know and uh, that's why we need things like the 12 step program and aa and stuff to keep them on the straight and narrow you know like and stay away from even a sniff or a smell of alcohol for example i think whatever works for people i think we're all going to be on our own path what matters the most is that you're on a path that works best for you and that's why i say that worked for me it probably mm. doesn't work for 95 to 99 percent of others out there for my husband and I, it did work. He's an ex-alcoholic as well. Uh, and we kind of both took the same path. We were like, nope, enough, this is done. Most people can't do that. And I recognize that. So it's finding the resources, finding the help, signing up for programs, create a community. If you're creating the best version of yourself, then that's what matters. How you're getting there is your own train, your own journey. But that you're getting towards that healthier path, that's the ultimate success. Mm. And, and, and mentally, like, how did you deal with those slip ups? Did you, were they like, ah, oh, flip or what did you help? At the time? Yeah. At the time it was a lot of shaming because that's what it is in the first place. An eating disorder develops shame, alcoholism. It's that morning after that develops shame and guilt. Those two words, shame and guilt are just, they eat you up. Uh, with time, I think that the last time, honestly, I, I drank to a point where I woke up and I was like, oh, Sarah, too old for this shit. It was probably like three years ago in Vegas. And my husband and I were, it was the night after the Grammys. And we 
we went out. We had fun. It was the first time the two of us went out. We were dressed up to the nines and we had mm -hmm. fun. And it was a very different than in the past. Like I never went out to have fun. I went out to get wasted. And, or I would drink at home to get wasted. So it was a very different approach. But the morning after we woke up and I was like, what the hell? No, no, no. So we did like the buffet thing in the morning and uh, we went to a show later in the night. So it's developing kindness and self-love towards yourself. Um, to answer your question, you start to realize you're human and you start to realize you're going to screw up. If it's falling back into old habits, if it is making the wrong choice with some, or maybe it's not the wrong choice. If you're learning something along the way, it's never the mm -hmm. wrong choice. It's just a correction, I'll say. So, you know, with time, I've developed more of a compassion and to say, what am I learning from this? What happened? Then, uh, you know, like getting hit with the ruler on your hand or something. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really what you're taking away from it. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yes, we, we're definitely like our own worst critics and hard on ourselves when it comes to a lot of these things. And like you said, yeah, it's important to to not be as harsh on, you know, certain times to give ourselves a little bit of leeway and, and to help us get over things. Um, so, so basically, going back to your story, at, at this time, things weren't necessarily getting much better for you at all, actually, because you, you had a lump in your throat or you found a lump in your throat. So, Maybe you can kind of take us back to that day, um, you know, what, what actually happened and then what, what happened afterwards as well. Sure. When, when I was first, um, so there's two rounds of college in Boston. The first time I went away, I was at Northeastern. And that's when I really started to drink heavily and enjoy more of the party going out life. I ended up going through the first trimester and I almost, almost finished the first trimester, but it was the first time in my life that I wasn't getting straight A's. I was doing really poorly because I wasn't doing any of the work. I wasn't going to the classes. Uh, so I ended up dropping out and that's when I went back to my family's um, home in Connecticut and that already felt like a failure. That to me was like a big, you screwed up big time here, Sarah. This is really not great. And at that time was when I had this lump in my neck since, uh, since I was in high school, but it just got bigger and bigger and bigger until finally it was, uh, my mom urged me to go to get it checked out. Um, it was after I went to one of the annual checkups and she urged me to go get it checked out. And I did. And in that moment, the pediatrician called up to Yale New Haven hospital and got me an appointment to get a CAT scan of, and, uh, and later a biopsy, but it was to get it checked out. And I'm like, okay, what, what's going on here? And she's like, you just need to go there right away. And I'm like, you want to tell me anything? And of course, as doctors, they can't tell you anything because it's liability here in the US. So that's when I found out what this lump was. And it was being diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma two weeks later. Mm -hmm. That at 19 is, you know, first it's dropping out of, high, of college. Then you're diagnosed with cancer. So it's like a double punch of what is going on. And your whole life flips upside down in that moment because things that you thought were important, like, you know, when am I going back to school? How's my boyfriend? All of a sudden, things like that don't matter. What still did matter was an eating disorder. And it's a really screwed up mentality to have an addiction like such, because even though my health should have been the number one concern, it was still maintaining my, um, my issues with food and how I was going to handle that. So that was being diagnosed and that kind of leads into where I was after. Hmm. And wow, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, well, what was it like? Like, I mean, was there a bit of time between the tests and the diagnosis? What was the time period like? And what was the weight like? You know, it's one of the worst things ever to wait between getting an exam like that and getting the results. Um, it's like the biggest limbo that mm -hmm. you don't know. You can't sleep. You don't function 100% because you earn constantly this what if. And I knew nothing about yoga. I knew nothing about breathing. I knew nothing about mental health back then. It was just a survival mode. 
So you have anxiety and you're struggling with it on top of having a triple dose of anxiety because you don't know what the hell is your life going to be like in, yes. you know, however long. So it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of anxiety and uh, you don't know what your health is going to be like. So it's all the basic pillars of humanity that creates wow. us as human beings to be okay. It's just like, we're just going to pull all these out from you. Mm. like floating. Wow. Sarah. And, and, I mean, it's just, it's hard to comprehend how you must feel in that, in that time. Did you have a feeling of like impending doom or did you kind of feel like this is not good or, or, or were you like, oh, it's probably nothing kind of, what, what kind of mentality did you have in that period? Great question. I think I wanted to believe that everything was fine. And that's probably what I tried to portray on the outside. Deep down, I knew something was wrong. I think, uh, you know, if it's your body, you know, in your body, something's not right. How I always tried to portray to the outside world is that everything is fine. And that's part of what I developed with in eating disorders. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm okay. But it's deep down stuff isn't okay. So you start to once again, develop that distance between mind and body even further. Wow. So, so you had that, you had that uh, lump on your neck for a long time then? It grew, yeah. It, be, it started as a bean. We called it a bean in high school because someone was giving me a neck massage. And I was like, what the heck is this? And I was like, I don't know. Let's just call it a bean. It's, um, it's, it was in my neck as part of the lymphatic system. But then it started to grow more and more to the point it was almost the size of a golf ball. So it was oh, really wow. not normal. Um, that was in my neck. So it metastasizes. And when cancer cells double, I mean, it's like compounded interest. It doubles and doubles fast. Where was it, Sarah? Like just on the side or down at the bottom? Um, yeah, it's, if you go down the scalenes in the neck, which is one of the neck muscles, so it's right above the collarbone. Yeah. Um, that also ties up to just under the ear. So there's a line uh, that goes from down the side of the neck. Uh, hmm. Those are all your lymph nodes, one of the main parts of the lymph nodes in your body. They run all throughout your body, but that's one of the main ones. Wow. And you ended up uh, actually going through 10 months of chemo and radiation and goodness, it just uh, must have been so tough. But what was your experience of that like during that period? I, um, when most kids in college were thinking about what party they were going to, I was wondering, am I getting chemo next week? So it really put me in the weird category for sure. Mm. Uh, the chemotherapy, I, I hated. I hated. I was fearful every day about if my hair was going to fall out. Mm. As a female, you really identify, and even males, and you identify with how you look. If you're already self-conscious about how you look and you don't like how your body is, and then, oh, yeah, we're going to make your hair fall out. It doubles the, I really don't like myself. Um, and even when people were like, oh, you have a cute, you have a great shape of a head. And it's like, that doesn't make me feel mm. any better. <laughs> wow. So I, but I fought and I fought for a long time. And there were ups and there was many downs. But um, especially I was in the PD section, which was a blessing because you're around a higher energy than when... Mm. I, I briefly was in the adult oncology. The adult oncology is really, at least when I was there 16 years ago, it's a really depressing feeling. You're just in these rows. It's like a cattle call and you just get plugged into your IVs. Um, I'm sure they've come a long way now, but it's still, it's not a pleasant experience. Um, for kids in PD, at least it was, I hate clowns. They had clowns. Um, they had dogs sometimes. Do you have like people who are a little bit higher energy and uplifting? Mm -hmm. It was sad, of course, seeing babies going through chemotherapy because mm -hmm. like I did dumb things in my life. Okay. So I get it. I haven't yeah. helped this situation, but that little kid was born into it. So there was also that heartbreak feeling, but at the same time, I took it as a responsibility for myself to stay upbeat, to stay strong. And I think that was an underlying blessing when you're going through something like chemotherapy and, and fighting any kind of disease like that, you have to develop an inner strength and an inner resilience to keep propelling yourself strong and forward. And mm -hmm. that same thought process that wants to put you down, you just have to keep overriding it. And like, I'm rebuilding myself. I still struggled with the eating disorder. So it was, you know, really a, 
uh, a split, a bipolar mentality mm -hmm. that I wanted this health, yet I wasn't doing the, st the steps to create that health. But then at the same time, you had the mental strength to kind of still be positive. It's really this weird mm. mix, isn't it? The mind has a really powerful capability. My mind has always been, I mean, all of our minds are super strong. The mind can override anything else within the body and our human capacity. Um, but at, my mind really just overrode everything. And it was like, what do I want? How do I want to be? And coming back to that idea that I was, I can be, and I was a chameleon. So the face that I was there was very different than the face I was when I was by myself. Mm. It's funny. I always actually just think, just saying, hearing what you're saying now, Sarah, about the mind being so strong, it's almost like hospitals and places of, of like this should, we should try and bring the energy up and, and have, sort of have that sort of childlike, not childlike, maybe it's not the right word, but like, just a, um, an uplifting environment more because I don't know, how, like you can't sort of overstate how important you're trying to be positive is in, in these kind of situations, isn't it? And it's, it's kind of weird that there's such a big difference between like kids and then adults. Suddenly that's not important anymore. We don't need to feel like, you know, supported by fun people and good people. And I, and I think it's, you know, it's really actually quite a fascinating sort of thing to think about why it's so different, you know? It's a great point that you bring up. I mean, you go into a kid section and there's colors, there's mm. crayons, and you go into an adult section and you have the news on. Mm. It's yeah. really, you know, and it's the latest shooting or a fire mm. or a bombing or the president. And it's, mm. I always to turn it off. I bring my headphones everywhere with me because if I don't <laughs> want to see, I, that's my responsibility to tune it out. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's really night and day when you go from kids to adults, but it's true. And that's why I try and create that element of play mm -hmm. um, that you, you to feel not just youthful, but also to stay upright and happy and curious about the world yeah. around you. Yeah. yeah. I always think like there's, there's some great like experiments you could do with when it comes to health and things and say like in a hospital, you know, why don't like at the end of a corridor, you have a guy like on a guitar and he's just like playing guitar or whatever, like throughout the day. And, um, I don't know, just, uh, you, you actually serve people nice food. You know, these are not crazy ideas, just like simple things, which could just literally change, like change, you know, just change things drastically actually. You bring up food and it's actually an upcoming uh, conversation I'm going to have with somebody else that she brought it up in one of her, Nikki Sharp, she's based, now she's in New York or LA, but uh, she was in London at the time. And she posted something about the food in, um, the food in hospitals. And I was like, mm. oh, 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 like all over that. Because the times I was there, and even when I've gone back for checkups recently, you have pastries, Chinese mm. food, Italian Parmesan with like, bread and cheeses and if it's fresh it's one thing but this is not fresh because you're in the middle mm. of new haven and it's not exactly little italy and in, in rome <laughs> but anyway it's all crap in short it's all crap there's burgers and fries and i remember one time going to get my bloods taken uh and there was a kid sitting in the lobby in the waiting area and he had burgers and fries and I said to the woman taking my blood, man, I can't believe that that's still the only thing that they feed these kids. And she was like, well, at least he's eating. And I was like, that's exactly the wrong mentality that I want to fight against. Because mm -hmm. it's what you're putting into your body. If you're going through cancer treatment, that is the prime time to learn how to take care of yourself instead of just putting it all into the medicines. Uh, get the, the worst part is that's what doctors want you to believe, that they have the only tool that's going to fix you because they don't mm -hmm. learn any of that in, in their schooling. So it's really, at least in the United States, it's really, really messed up healthcare system. It's mm -hmm. really messed up. And the sugar, like you go like, oh, you've got cancer. All right, well, here's jelly, here's fruit juice, here's custard, here's... And you're like thinking, this is ridiculous, you know, like. Have a jello. Here's a lollipop. Yeah. It's like, what? Yeah. yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. 
Yeah, he has a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Like, you know, yeah, it's yeah. just like, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's just mind boggling, to be honest with you. Like, it's quite, quite crazy, actually. Um, so, yeah, actually, I guess talking about the hospital, um, you uh, now have a tattoo where you used to kind of get your chemo inserted. So what, what does that uh, ta- tattoo on your arm actually symbolize? Yeah, it says Sankalpa. I had it put over there. Uh, this is an older tattoo, but probably about 10 years ago, 10, 11, 12 years ago. It says Sankalpa, which means loosely determination, purpose, or will. Hmm. In uh, where the line, the pick line goes is straight to your heart. So it went from my arm. So they didn't have to keep sticking me with the needles each time for chemotherapy from my arm to my heart. And I am a believer that if I am staying determined in the path uh, that is true and intuitive to my heart, it'll always be connected and I can't go wrong. Hmm. Uh, that was my initial reasoning behind the tattoo, which totally sold mom on it. So it, it worked, <laughs> uh, but it's something that means uh, it's, it's one of my near and dearest tattoos that I have. Hmm. So meaningful, these kind of symbolic things, just to remember your, where you're from, what you've done, and how far you've come, and these kinds of things. So, yeah, it's, it's really, really great. And, you know, you, you'd mentioned it a little bit, Sarah, like, after you'd been through the chemo, and you were sort of officially in re- remission, which it's actually been um, 16 years now, I think so, which is amazing, which is awesome. Um, you find yourself still in like a, a bit of a strange place where you were you were mentally, you knew you had a second chance at life. Like right? you were like, yes, we, you know, it's done. I'm feeling better, whatever it is, but, but you're still struggling with the eating disorder. Um, that must've been really hard on you as well. I felt this big pressure that I needed to do something amazing. Now, after mm. when you're given a second chance in life, I felt this big pressure that I had to be incredible. I always put that pressure on myself ever since I was young to overachieve, to be a plus student. It was, it was never my parents. It was always me. Um, and even after cancer, I felt this double pressure that you are a lucky one and now you need to go out and do something awesome. But I still, when you don't learn the foundation, you will fall right back into old habits. And that's exactly what I did. The years later, so we'll start talking about the healing path. The years later, I had a job in advertising after college. I got a job in advertising as a junior art director at a great ad agency in Boston. Phenomenal experience and opportunity. It's, it's very rare. Uh, so I, f- I felt very blessed for that. The downturn of the economy, um, of course, <laughs> laid off majority of anybody in advertising. And I was one of them. So then I was unemployed. I felt, once again, not good enough, not worthy. And that put me really deep into a spiral of an eating disorder. Again, (laughs) I was married at the time, uh, or I was just about to be married. And then I got married later when I was freelancing. Um, And the struggle continued, and it continued. And it wasn't until uh, at that time, it it reached a point where when I did start to work again, that it got, it it was better. And I stopped throwing, to be very specific, I stopped throwing up, I don't know how long it was, but it was around that time when I started working full time again. What started to heal was when I started taking up yoga. And when I started yoga, it was how many calories am I going to burn in this? I'm so used to going to the gym. But I started to realize that yoga wasn't about the physical benefits, but it was everything that started to heal that disconnect from my mind and my body that I started to appreciate my body can hold these arm balances, that I had the strength for a reason, that the body was meant to be appreciated and loved and not just morphed and changed into something that it wasn't supposed to be. Uh, to be playful, because in yoga, you're going to fall on your butt a lot of times, <laughs> but it's learning to get back up each time, and that's where a big resilience aspect comes into play. Uh, that was really the start of the healing path for me was when I started to do yoga Um, and why I became so passionate enough about it that I actually left my job in corporate to start teaching yoga, which I did for about eight years after I only recently stopped teaching. And, but, but your yoga journey wasn't necessarily love at first asana, was it? 
Absolutely. And I say this to people all the time. If you don't like yoga, it's okay. You don't have to like the first class. I hated mine. <laughs> I really hated yoga. It was an Ashtanga class in a gym. I remember thinking, I'm like, oh, it's the same sequence again. And if I did do another Chaturanga push-up or Sun A or B, I hate these things. <laughs> So I encourage people, if you are someone who's one of those, and don't say you should get into yoga, do it because you freaking want to do it. Uh, find something that you connect with and that there are so many different kinds of practices out there. Call it stretch time, like whatever you need to tell yourself um, that it doesn't have to be the first one that you absolutely love, but to keep going back and to try something different. It's like dating. You have to try again, or marriage. In my case, you have to try and see if <laughs> right. No, I, I think actually okay. that's a challenge that, like most people have with everything, you know, like if, especially starting something new. It's it's not enjoyable when you start something new because you're no good at it, um, and yeah, you're comparing yourself to other people in the class or whatever it is, and you may be thinking about what else you could do with your time, sort of thing. So. You literally, you have to work through, you know, the first few weeks, months, whatever it is of, of doing something if you actually want to reap the rewards, I think, at the end of it. Absolutely. We go back to the beginning conversation we had about the little kids who start skiing at a very young age and you're, you're good. Your body remembers it for the rest of your life. But for the adults who start skiing at, say, 35, 40, mm -hmm. you're in for a rough time. Let me tell you, bring some elbow pads and some yeah. butt pads. <laughs> but when you start, you're correct. Everything is hard. It's hard until it becomes easy. Mm -hmm. And when I started yoga, I wasn't flexible. I was behind a desk, hunched over because I was a graphic designer. You are huddled over a computer. Um, I couldn't touch my toes. So people think like, oh, you were just so born flexible like that. And it's like, mm -hmm. nope, nope. Wow. I worked my butt off to get where I am here. Mm -hmm. So you got to put the work in. You got to keep going back to try. And I think those are the best lessons of life that you get from yoga. That it's not going to be easy. And mm -hmm. there are going to be days where you are more flexible than others. There's certain times of the day that you're more flexible than mm -hmm. others. You wake up and you try and touch your hamstring, your, your toes, your hamstrings are going to scream at you no matter what age you are. Yeah. Even if you're a gymnast. But towards the middle of the day, the afternoon, you're warmed up a little bit, or maybe you went to the gym already. You, it's a lot easier. So in each moment, your mind is going to be different, and, and your moods are going to be different. Your energy is going to be different. Same goes with yoga. In each moment, your body is going to be completely different. But how do you react to it, and how do you become attuned with it? Yeah, I love that. I think it's so important. People don't realize that they can feel so different in one week, you know, so they always think they need to have this certain feeling of like, I'm so ready for this and I feel great. And they, I think a lot of people often think other people feel like that. And, um, but like you, it's so good that people like yourself who are, you know, really great, let's say at yoga. And I say like, you know what, half the time I, I feel stiff and, and tight and uncomfortable in my own body. And it just takes, you know, the, 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 the stiffness itself is just one more little challenge that you'll have in your life and learn to work through it again. And that's the sort of value of it. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's great. It's great to, a great reminder, actually. And you ended up actually creating sort of your own uh, series, isn't it, called Unfuck Your Body. And off the back of being, you know, working with people one on one, then you found a lot of things that you thought sort of that you could add, isn't it? True. And um, just to be grammatically clear here, because the U.S. Patent Office mm -hmm. doesn't agree with me, but it's unfuck without the U. So it is <laughs> technically um, kosher, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my word. Really? <laughs> is that what they say? <laughs> they, I, they, okay. This is, this is Sarah's issue with part of, part of her issues with the government here. But uh, <laughs> I paid for the trademark, passed everything. Six months later, they revoked it because it was. Um, improper language. So they really just wanted to take my money. Uh, and mm. now it's, now I'm getting emails from every lawyer in the country saying we can represent you. And it's like, for what, for that? I'm sorry. If someone wants to take unfuck your body, go for it. Okay. Good luck fighting whatever <laughs> attorney you want. But what it does is I worked a lot with private clients, um, especially here in Miami. And it was the yoga flow for me. I love flow and yoga for myself. But I started to get really bored. I get bored fast. Um, 
I started to get really bored with teaching the same flows in a lot of ways um, with people who were more interested that they would walk up to you after and say, oh, okay, so how do I get into a handstand? Oh my God, your playlist was so amazing. And I was like, if that's the only thing you took out of this class, then I really don't even <laughs> Like you would answer their question because you're a kind person and you're not a jerk. But at the same time, you're like, if that's the only thing you took out of this, I, this isn't the, this is no longer the audience for me. Um, I started to realize, and I, I'll diverge a little bit here. I started to realize what I loved about teaching yoga was sending a message across. And that's where I really started to get more into, I can do the speaking and I don't have to do the, the flow along with it. Now I incorporate it once in a while for events, but more than anything, I loved providing a message that people would listen to, be inspired by and want to take positive action in their own minds with. So, so, so what was it exactly? Like, what was the series? Like, how do you, how do you, how can you explain it? Yes. Thank you for taking me back. Um, the unfuck your body series was originally derived from teaching a lot of private students, uh, that they needed to learn how to move their body again. They needed to create, it's more mobility than anything. It's not a yoga series, but it's how to be mobile in your life we do so many things every day to fuck our bodies up you know mm -hmm. we're we're seated for hours uh we're you know crouched over poor posture in a chair in a car we're hunched over we have a bag on one shoulder but what are we doing to undo that and this series works through different parts of the body to work those specific areas now you can starting with the neck the shoulders the upper back your low back your hips hamstrings, your quads, knees, ankles, your wrists. So one of my favorites, I created little mini series with them together. And one of my favorites is um, unfuck your body for uh, text addicts. So you're stretching out the wrists and you're working out your forearms <laughs> and also your posture because it's all intertwined together. So it's, uh, it's really about learning to move your body again without drugs, without pills without surgeries. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, if movement is so important, say, eh? like it's amazing, yeah, how, how, much, how little we actually do these days, a lot of people, especially people that are stuck, you know, in their corporate jobs and these sort of things. And even if they just did, I don't know, like 10 minutes a day to kind of start with, it's not a lot, you know, and it's a, it's a good place to start. So um, I'm sure it's an amazing series. So just moving on like a little bit, uh, last year you wrote an amazing book called Living Cancer Free. Um, maybe you can just tell us a little bit uh, about the book and kind of what brought it about. The cancer part, and I always preface this, is a cancer can be defined in many ways. It can be the physical cancer disease, which I've been there, done that. But it's also the poor relationships that we're in. It's the, the negative thoughts that we're putting into our minds every day. It's the poor eating habits, the poor drinking habits, um, the shoulds. It's all of those things together. Those are all cancers. And that's what I propose in this book. It's redefining what is a cancer. I take you through my story and history. I take you through the downs, um, which we've talked a lot about in this podcast, but I, it's really, it's detailed. It's raw. It's honest. I don't hold anything back. I put everything in, um, uh, because I really wanted to connect and help people. The more honest you can be, I think the more you can connect with people in those moments, uh, those emotions, because they say, okay, it's not just me. The second part of the book starts to take you through the healing process where I found yoga, where I started to my first marriage into moving into, re-evolving my career again and again and again, finding another marriage. Um, and then the last part of the book gives 52 tips, tricks, exercises on how any warrior reading the book can follow a similar path. And it creates a reconnection of the, the mind, the body. You're, it takes you through four different elements. One is to detox, which has nothing to do with juices. It has everything to do with unfollowing stupid people on social media, um, unsubscribing to those 50 emails that we just swipe, delete, swipe, delete. Uh, it has everything to do with, you know, creating the tribe around you. If you're like the five most important people. Well, they better be pretty awesome that are going to inspire and uplift you. Mm. Uh, the next part is about creating mind body connection. 
Uh, the other part is about nourishing yourself, which goes beyond food. It's also what you're telling yourself and creating positive affirmations. And then the last part is about living cancer free based on the manifesto that I created. It's a, a 14 phrase um, series. It started as a poster and then it became the values that I live throughout my life. Whenever I'm making decisions, hard ones, and I kind of go back to and I think of them and I'm like, okay, is this aligning with who I really want to be and who I am? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, the, that's the book. I, and that's the structure of the book. What brought me to write it, I was walking back from the beach one day when we lived on the beach. And all of a sudden in my mind, it just came to me living cancer free. And I was like, that's a great title. I've always been really good with titles for things. And I was like, that's a great title. <laughs> And I've had a lot of people in the past say, you have to write a book. You have to write a book. I'm like, I'm not an author. Like I write blog posts every now and then, but I'm not an author. Mm. But I, I am. And I'm a writer and I'm creative in every aspect, be it photography, video. Um, and so I knew that part of my own personal healing journey had to be getting this out. And part mm. of my path as a warrior and as a motivation in the world, as a give back, was to provide the tools which is why it was important for me to put in this book, not just the problem, but also offer solution. I think too many times there's autobiographies that are telling you how about this person, that it becomes very one-sided. So for me, it was very important to have, here's how you can do it too, um, to create a balance and actionable steps. Yeah, I think that's, that's such a good part of a book is like uh, having kind of you know, this tutorial and steps to, 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 you know, people that people can follow and, and do actually some tasks or actions off the back of it. That's where, that's the kind of different differentiating factor that like is really, really helpful. Um, you just mentioned values when, and you know, you liked things that you do to line up with your values. What are your values? If you want to make change, you know, take action on it. Um, never settle for something intuitively that you know can be better. And oftentimes that's ourselves. It's like those lies that we tell ourselves, if you can be better, um, go for it. To travel, to experience things, to value those experiences over physical things, um, to load up your passport and see the world. Let that be your best education that you can. Um, and you have the power to create any life that you wish for. You just have to take action on it. Those are just a few. Um, you know, cool. another one is never try, never know. If you, you can sit there in the what if phase, but until you actually take that leap, you'll, you'll be stuck in the what if. And I think the worst, um, there's a quote, and I'm, I'm going to misquote it now, but it, regret will kill you far greater than failure. And it's better to fail at something than it is to wish you did it. Those are a few. Mm, cool. I love so that. That's great. Yeah. People should uh, definitely go check that out. You can check out your, your manifesto and it's, there's some really good ones in there. And it's just a good reminder for everyone that, that uh, we should all have our own little manifesto for ourselves that, that we can reference because t things get tough and you want to, you know, will remind yourself of what your, your deeper meaning is in your life. And it's, I think it's really awesome. And you actually just touched on it a bit earlier. You spoke about, um, you know, th other kinds of cancers in our live, lives and these things can kind of cause a, a dis-ease in our body. Um, what does that really sort of mean? When we're at ease, we're in a flow. When we feel good, we are feeling one. Um, that sounds really yogic, I know. But we <laughs> feel like connected, the best way I can put it, we feel connected with where we are, what we're doing, who we're around. When we're in a state of dis-ease, we're exactly the opposite of that. So we feel mm -hmm. disconnected from ourselves. We don't really know what we're doing. We feel lost, we feel, um, and it's okay to feel lost, but on a path towards finding, if that makes sense. Um, you feel really like in a bubble in a lot of ways, or what am I doing? Uh, the disease is in short stress and not the good kind of stress that creates a change or a challenge, it's the stress that eats away at who you are, your energy, your, uh, your overall health. So the dis-ease really pulls life away from you in many ways. Mm. As opposed to disease being like the end state of having a being in a state of dis-ease for long enough. 
I think it's chronic versus um, situational. So a mm. disease is a noun and it's a, a thing, but mm. the disease is more of a chronic, uh, prolonged stressor that affects every area of your life. And what are some of the common ones you, you mentioned, like people, are there some others, like I suppose food maybe could be like a, another one. Are there others that are like common that you've seen? Sure. The, we all have that one person in our lives who's really just a jerk and we hate spending time around them. That's that disease. That's that cancer in our life. And we maybe can't avoid them, you know, but we can also put a distance or limit our time. Uh, but if you're constantly around that person, that's, that becomes a really bad cancer. Uh, the mm. foods, of course, if you're having those three drinks every single night to help yourself sleep, that's a cancer. If you are waking up every morning and saying, you're so stupid, you look awful, that's mm -hmm. a cancer. Um, you are working 80 hours a week in a job you really hate, that's a cancer. So those are all, I believe, especially in the United States, those are majority of uh, a short list majority of what different cancers are mm -hmm. yeah for sure so i think it's a common thing globally to be to be fair actually so yeah some great lessons in there so so thanks for those you mentioned your book was very raw and uh, actually a lot of uh, your book references uh, your journal when from when you were younger um can you maybe sort of tell us uh, you know why journaling why you were journaling like when you were, you were younger and like how helpful was it for you Journaling is a powerful tool to get out your mental shit. And then in any people, not just teenagers, but in any people, adults who are asking, you know, I'm going through this. I say journal, write it out because it gets, it, it validates how you're feeling without judgment and you get it out. You physically have to get it out. Um, and I think at a young time when I didn't know how to put a voice behind it, just being able to write it was like a safe place for me. Uh, it was important to put in the journal entries because I wanted it to be timely and real to how I was feeling in that moment. So I left some of the typos, some of the errors, some of the things that weren't perfect yeah. in there because I think it was really, it was, it was what it was. Um, and that's where I wanted to go back and reference that throughout the book to make it as real as possible to what I was feeling in that moment. How did it make you feel when you read some of those uh, journal entries? <laughs> Sometimes, uh, there was most of the time, most of the time I was really proud and happy to how far I, I had come. Sometimes I was like, wow, this girl is really sad. I feel really bad for this girl. And then I started yeah. thinking like that, that was me. Mm. Um, other times I got really, I mean, uh, there was a few times when I got sad. But most of the time, it was really powerful, which was the opposite of what a lot of people around me were thinking. They're like, are you okay? Or how are you feeling? And I was like, I'm great. This girl had problems, man. I am so far from who this girl was. So it was really powerful for myself. Um, there were certain moments that came up. I was reading through one of, the, one of the entries right after I was just about finishing up radiation. And I came across the, the words between the first round of radiation and the second round, I had like a week or two off. And I was like, oh, now I can live free. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Girl wrote that many moons ago. And now wow. these little seeds get planted in our brains. So I remember I was writing the book in Playa del Carmen when I read that. And I got chills. I just stopped what I was doing. Jeez. I was like, whoa, what's going on here? So I was seeing those words so many years. It was about 13 years between them, give or take. It's amazing. You know, you plant seeds in your own mind that you have no idea when those plants are going to pop up. Yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> you know, it's amazing as well. As like, I just thinking when you're talking there, it, it could be really therapeutic or healing in a way of like, it's almost like doing inner child work. You know, you, you, you can, you can soothe that, that younger person inside of you and go like, it's okay now. Like, you know, and when you're reading those entries and, and, and really have like a sort of caring, um, relationship with that young person that was there before and I think that's maybe just another reason I'd never really thought of why it's a good idea to journal because you can in the future you'll look back and you'll be able to really nurture that that younger self you know it's a great point that you bring up because that's what a lot of from what I read and from what I 
have heard when you are dealing with childhood issues that still are there and prevalent in your adult life. That's what a lot of psychologists will encourage you to do is go back to that childlike state where you were that you left off. Mm -hmm. And you, exactly as you said, you want to give that kid a hug and just say whatever it is that you would want to say to that child in that moment that you, you were lacking. Um, so mm-hmm. it's exactly, it's exactly that. Great. Yeah. And, and Sarah, look, just uh, slightly more on the, on the sort of practical side, you actually published the book yourself and went through a sort of self-publishing process. What was that like? I self-published because I, I knew I wasn't out to make millions from the book. I knew the point of the book was to get the information out there as soon as possible and create more of the movement and the talk and the conversation around it. That was more, it was a story that I wanted to share, but then go deeper when I was doing speaking events, uh, doing small group events. Um, It's now leading into doing, uh, I'm actually going to be recording soon an audio version of the book, um, a 28 day series that I'm going to be coming out with pulls from some of the exercises that are in the, the end part of the book, the workbook. So it's, um, and I'm doing it a yoga event in Boston as well. And it ties in some of the exercises. So it's, it's extracting the information from the book to give it a different life and legs. Mm -hmm. The self publishing is, um, if you want, if you have a publisher and you want to be the next, uh, Stephen King, get a publisher, don't self publish. But if you just want to get your message out there, you want to put it in the hands of you know where you want to and you're want to control that then you know self publishing can be really empowering and uh mm. it's faster it i'm a designer by trade so for me it was really important to design the whole interior the cover i designed every aspect of the book so for me it was also an art project in many ways. There's some hidden messages within the book as well with some of the artwork. Um, so that's, it, it was fun in a lot of ways. Mm. A quick story, when the, the first proofs came in, they sent me two proofs of the book and it came in the mail and my husband got it and I left mm-hmm. it on the counter. He's like, you don't want to open it? I was like, nope, because if the cover <laughs> is off, I'm going to freak out or oh, if the screen is too much. <laughs> So he had to open it and he shows it to me and I'm like peeking over his shoulder and I was like, how's it look? He's like, it looks great. And I was like, okay, let me see it. But it was almost that, that inner critic once again, that was like, oh, wow. what if I screwed up? Uh, mm. Cause I knew it would take me a long time. If I had one, if the interior of the book was off, it would take, it would take a couple days to fix that. Well, we'll put it that way, but uh, yes, it was fine. It was fine. Oh, what a relief. <laughs> and and you, you talk about hidden messages. What, is it like sort of sacred geometry sort of stuff or what, what were the messages or is it still a secret? <laughs> I'm deep. I'm not that deep. But one of the things is you can, um, you'll follow the arrows that are in the chapter pages. So the first Ooh. part of the book, we're going downhill, baby. And then the next part of the book, we're going up. So that's ah, one cool. of them. Ah, awesome. Okay, cool. And, and has, has a book given you sort of leverage maybe that you not do necessarily seeking but has it given you given you any sort of leverage now i'm working on in some ways in some ways people who have read my story and they're like damn um some friends who have read the story they're like i had no idea and then other people who know me and they're like this honestly is really good you need to get it into the hands of teenagers moms and teenagers so Mm -hmm. I, part of my due diligence now is to do another resurgence of the book uh, because it hasn't been given the proper marketing push because uh, mm. I know it needs to be in the hands of many more, especially teenagers. There's those crucial moments in your life that you, you don't feel comfortable talking to mom and dad about. Your friends, you got to act cool in front of, but this mm. is a, a real accountable uh, story and life that many teenagers I think can associate with eating disorder or no cancer or no you, Mm. we all struggled in high school. It was a zoo in high school. We all do. And I can only imagine in today's day and age with social media, that's only gotten worse. Yeah. I mean, the whole time you've been saying your story, that's what I've been thinking. I'm like, you know, youngsters really kind of need to, you know, to listen to this podcast, your story, read your book, because 
it is so familiar for a lot of them. So um, yeah, definitely it will be great getting that out into, into more youngsters hands. That's for sure. So you talk a lot about like living free a lot and you're known as the live free warrior. What does living free actually mean? Living free is really that empowered choice that you are authentic. You are living your truth. You are being you, you're owning that weird. You're okay with it. And you're making the choice for what you believe. It's not the shoulds. It's not society. It's not your school. It's the choice that you're making because it's the best for you. That's the living free. The warrior part is sometimes you got to fight for something. Sometimes you need to stand up and you need to go a different route or take a right when everyone else is going left. Mm. Um, a warrior too isn't a fighter always. And that's maybe a misconception. I learned a lot from martial arts trainings that I've done. And you're, you're fighting for defense. You're not fighting for hurting someone else. You're fighting for defense. But fighting sometimes is taking the pause or taking the quiet route. So that's the warrior part, to, do the, to, to be okay, that inner strength, to do the best for you. Mm. There's, wow, a, there's an amazing book called The Way of the Peaceful Warrior. Mm. And uh, it reminds me a lot, a lot about what you just said there now. Who's the author? Because uh, I think I know it. Is it Bach? I don't know. I can't remember. I read it so long ago, to be honest with you. Okay. I, I would totally butcher the name. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. But I love what you say there. It's just such a, it's such a truth. You know, there's a difference between aggression and a warrior. Like a warrior is someone who you, is, is so brave, but also has the certain, certain, the certain certainty and calmness about them. And uh, yeah, it's, just, it's a great... A great analogy, and, I, and you, you mentioned the word choice a lot, you know, and the, you, you also talk about it being the other, the big C, you know, and, and I think that's, that's so great to, to make choices and make decisions that are w suiting you and not the people around you is, is really freedom, isn't it? Absolutely. And it's that, that intuition and that courage to speak up for that C, that choice, to say, nope, this is what I want. And, uh, you know, that's something I came into at a much older age. I'm okay to say, nope, I'm going to go for the vegan fare over here. And yeah, you're going to have to make me something separate when we were in a, the own your weird actually came from a trip in Fiji. And this bridges off of what we were just saying about choice. Everybody else on this trip, it was supposed to be like a wellness trip, but everybody else on this trip was, you know, and it's, it's not that it's a bad thing, but they were eating the meats, they were eating the, you know, whatever the cakes were, they were drinking the wine. And I was like, I'm not going to eat that, but I would love a double order of the vegetables. You know, do you have any, like, I think mm. they had like lentils. That was like what I had for protein. And the first couple of days I felt weird asking for it until finally it became a, you know what? Just own your weird. My husband mm. actually said it. He's like, just own your weird. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> You know, take that one and just like run with that. But it became about owning my weird to this is me. And by day, you know, three or four, the chefs knew exactly what I wanted. Everyone else was in a way you could see the way that they looked over and they were envious. They wanted to try what I had. I was like, well, you can order it too. And they're like, no, 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 I'm just going to have this. And it's like, that's a choice. You mm -hmm. can choose that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is my choice. <laughs> Love it. When you start making decisions, yeah. sometimes other people are like, they're like, oh, I should have done that. <laughs> and that's the way of a warrior. The warrior yeah. chooses that path and leads it for other people. Yeah, definitely. I was just wondering, do you know Kelsey Abbott at all? Sounds familiar. Just because I don't know, there's so many similarities. We had her on our podcast uh, not, not too long ago. And she's like, she talks a lot about like how we are all weirdos. Uh, she also says like, we should not say should and have to and all these sort of things. I was like, it's what you say is like very, very similar. It's just really interesting. Um, you know, and you both got fantastic stories. Um, but, but and you, anyway, I think you, I, I think you would love to connect yeah. with her actually. So we can organize that, uh, you know, after I the love chat connecting with fellow weirdos. Definitely. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, there's, some, there's power in collaboration. I always believe yeah. that there's power in collaboration and that's how, we've connected, you know, you can view the world as competitors mm. or you can build, you can view the world as collaborators. And when you're on a like path and uh, energy, you're, you're going to, again, I go back to yoga verbs, but it's, you're going to vibrate higher 
if you're mm. collaborating with people as opposed to fighting and going against them or thinking you have to get better. Yeah, I could not agree more with you. Like, you know what I mean? The, the more we can collaborate, the better. Like, let's stop competing so much. Co competition has a good place, you know, but we can actually do a lot more together a lot of the time. And um, it's, a, it's a great thing to actually sort of strive for. Look, I know the chat has been like, it's quite, I guess, serious, but it's like, you know, your story is um, a one, one worth being serious about. Like, what, what do you actually do for, say, fun like these days? Fun. <laughs> how, does that, how does that fit into your life? You know, part of travel is really one of my greatest uh, expenditures when it comes to spending money. Um, I will use a coupon for, you know, saving money or I'll, I'll go back and I'll order all my stuff on Amazon mm -hmm. to save money as opposed to, I'm not a big buyer when it comes to things. I buy electronics and I buy plane tickets. Um, mm -hmm. my husband, and I used to joke, I said, we spend money on the three A's and it's American airlines, it's <laughs> Apple products and it's, um, Adobe for all the creative <laughs> stuff. But, uh, for fun, I really, I love to see movies. I love to film and create. I love to be like a kid playing stupid jokes. Um, my husband and I will do a lot of that. It's to even have those little moments in the day that are just fun that you interact with people, like making a joke with somebody that you randomly pass. Um, of course, time with family and friends. Um, be a, dinners, be it, you know, memories or bringing back up. My family was recently down here. That's why I'm thinking of it. And mm. we took a walk to one of the local bakeries and stuff. And it's just, those are fun times that you stop life and you just remember what's really important. Um, and I'm coming up, I'm going to Boston and doing the Jimmy Fun Walk, which is to support childhood cancer. So that to me is really fun. Um, and I mean, the funnest moments are the stupidest moments that you don't expect that cost absolutely nothing yeah. where you're making a joke with the person that you love or a friend. And it just becomes like that, that belly laughter that you haven't had since you were a kid that you have tears down your eyes. <laughs> like those are really the fun moments for me that I hold true. That's cool. Yeah, so great. You know, it's so funny, like just speaking about the children's ward at the, at the hospital and stuff, it's something we tend to lose connection with is just all the, like you say, being weird, having a laugh at silly stuff, uh, having fun, playfulness. It's weird how these things tend to slowly be suppressed as we get older. But I think, you know, people like yourself are really trying to bring it forward and bring it into the fold again. And I think it's such a great idea because Life is about having some fun too, you know, it's so important. You mentioned your husband actually, and you guys have uh, like a, a fun relationship as well, Javier. And you also actually create amazing uh, content and you coach others. So maybe just tell us a little bit about what you guys actually do these days and, and, and what is it like working with your husband? We, um, we started to take on different creative projects. So we tried to work together all the time and we we know we need to have our own separate projects and projects together. He was recently doing a production for um, HBO. And uh, so he has like some of his own work. He has a long history in audio engineering and um, TV production. So sometimes it's doing his own projects for me. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's doing my own client work. And that's totally cool. When we come together and we do stuff, be it um, workshops, be it uh, helping each other, just supporting for filming, or if, he's leading a workshop and there's some yoga involved. It's like, sure, I'll help you with that. But it's more supportive of being helpful with each other. Uh, we are both on a similar, sorry, my leg got caught. We're both, um, we're both creating different programs that help people to be their absolute best. His has been in the works. He has precedent on this one. But his has been in the works for about 10 years. It's a 90-day program on how to rebirth yourself and, and be, wow. really be reborn because it's a lot of what he did in his own life. For myself, I'm working on a 28-day. I'm more like the millennial market who's like, <laughs> get me in, get me fast. Uh, but 28 days just like spoke to me. It was what a rehab would be like. So in those 28 days, it's how to renew your body. That's a project that I'm working on right now. And again, that's the 
ties into some of the exercises that are in the book. So those are online programs that people can attract to anywhere in the world because health isn't just for people that are in your area. It's, it's available for anybody. Um, those are two things that we're collectively working on that we want to really be able to hit any market. So he's more in the Spanish market. I'm more in the Anglo market and UK and Australia, like anywhere that English is more prevalent, of course. But, um, and it's hitting different age groups. He's a little bit older of a generation and I'm a little bit younger of a gen. So it's really, it crosses the board that we hit any demographic. Um, which is a really cool concept. If it's, if it's yeah. executed in the right way, it can be really, really powerful to say this can amplify. And at the end of the day, our, our main goal for what we're doing, be it speaking, be it these online programs, be it his production, be it my yoga event, whatever, it's to impact the lives of others in a positive way. So being mm -hmm. in a relationship with someone that has the same vision and the same creative path. So we're both filming, we're both doing lives we're both creating content um that inspires and it goes back to what we were saying before about collaborating it inspires um instead of competes because uh, we started and being very honest uh as i always am we started i started to feel like we were competing a little bit and that's where i started to back off uh, which when it's with someone that you love, it's, I mm. never want to feel like I'm competing. Never. Totally. But so that, and that's my own, uh, self-awareness to say, how am I approaching this? Okay. If you're, if you're jealous of somebody, it means you want to do something too. Mm. Um, so that's, you know, working together, it's, we have those fun moments and we have those stupid laughter. We have those fights, uh, but now it's learning better methods, habits, to go above and beyond that. So it's, we have our separate workspaces, um, time where we're doing our different projects, but at the end of the day, it's sharing and really creating a positive nice. message. Mm -hmm. I think that's so cool. Like, and it's so encouraging that as a couple, you can work together, you know, and you can build this cool business and life and things together, but also you're totally aware of your boundaries and that's just as important. Um, so it's, it's really cool. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not, you know, this is, this inspires maybe other people and other couples to do the same thing, which is great. And it's, it's, um, and it, I'm being very honest because it's not an easy path. Like my parents work together and they were in the same store. It's very different working across the room from your significant other and, they, the small things start to add up where they piss you off because they're making mm -hmm. the slightest noise on their keyboard. And then it's like, okay, <laughs> we need to change something here. So we certainly, certainly are not perfect. And we have certainly uh, had our fair share of headbutting moments. Um, and we really reached a, a hard moment uh, that we weren't really sure what direction we were going in. And I think that's, that's, that's a prime moment um, to in anyone's life, not just relationships, but in anyone's life, when you are starting to really question and go deep and all of a sudden feeling completely different, it's, it's a time to look back at yourself to take responsibility of what you're adding to the mix, but mm -hmm. also recognizing what you want to change. What do you want to create? And if it's creating a loving relationship, you're doing whatever you need to, to make that happen. So mm -hmm. if that's the empowerment part that you can maybe be afraid to work with your significant other, but don't get so stuck on one path that that's the way it has to be done. It's evolving each and every step of the way and you're remaking agreements and you're seeing how it goes and you're checking back in and in the mm. long term, you're going to find a way that works best for both of you. We're getting yeah. there. We're getting there. <laughs> yeah. Look, it's, it's a challenge, you know, when you spend 24 seven with somebody, like it doesn't matter who it is. It's always going to be a challenge, but like, you know, the, the, like you said, the cool thing is, is you keep those, that dialogue open, you know, and the most important thing to make sure it actually kind of does go well or well enough is just to keep communicating with, you know, how you're feeling and what's going on. And, and yeah, it's, uh, it's cool. It's awesome. I think it's great. Um, so maybe you can just tell us a little bit about uh, what you're excited about now, uh, what you have coming up in the future, and then uh, also where people can uh, just get hold of you. 
I'm really excited for creating more content uh, that will be streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube. I'm saying this out loud because it's going to hold me accountable. <laughs> uh, <Get it> first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I started developing this like two days ago, um, so it's very, very fresh. But I want, I'm really excited to start sharing more content on a regular basis that's live, that's interactive, that is both wellness travel based because it's a passion of mine, but also going deep like we did in this conversation today and sharing more of those, um, those harder moments for people to connect with, yet also providing the edutainment is, like, is what I like to say because uh, I think they're both very intrinsic for growth. I'm really excited for launching the 28-day program. My goal is beginning of 2020. Uh, I'm also excited for um, doing some upcoming content collaborations with some various wellness travel uh, platforms that I'm going to be writing for. Uh, I am excited to see where my miles and flights take me in this upcoming year. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be traveling for my birthday. I won't say where exactly, but I'll be traveling for my birthday. So I'm excited for a trip that I haven't taken in a long time and to keep evolving, connecting and evolving. You can find all of this and me on livefreewarrior.com. That's my main website and it'll connect to every platform out there. But just in case you're more social than you are web, you can find me at livefreewarrior on every platform, uh, especially Instagram, YouTube, on Facebook, it's livefreewarriortv. Those are my main sources. Cool. Awesome. Great. Man. Stuff's great. And yeah, definitely looking forward to more the interactive and the lives kind of thing. I think it's going to be great. You're really good at engaging with people and it's and you're very sort of approachable, which is awesome. And so we look forward to that. So sorry, so just, just, sorry just sorry. one quick question, Craig. Um, uh, Sarah, do, how will you do the, the YouTube and Facebook live separately or do, can you kind of do it together? Is there a platform for that? There is a platform for that. Yeah. If you're a creator, Vimeo is honestly one of the best platforms. You can okay. Go yeah. Cool. Thanks. Nice. And so just our last question there, Sarah, um, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Authenticity. It's just authenticity in its shortest form. You're being you and there's no excuses. There's no reasons. There's no rationalizations. It's just be you a hundred percent authentically weird you. <laughs> love it it's it's a simple truth is like we have human traits that are not always fitting into a certain box and just embrace those two it's i love it yeah really good and um look sarah we've had the most amazing conversation like uh honestly you've just been so forthcoming with like with tough times and and you know tough emotions and the wins and the trials and tribulations. So thank you for that because it really does create this connection with you. And um, I think, you you know, you're going to connect with so many people more and more in the future. Youngsters as well. I think you hit the nail on the head. I think youngsters definitely need to hear these kind of things because one way or another, they are all going through it. We all go through these same things, you know, but not everyone talks about it as candidly as you do. So, so just thank you so much for that. And, um, you know, talking about having a positive impact, I think you, you, that's one of your like values. And I think you, you really are doing that. I mean, just the two of us for, for sure right now and, and everyone listening, um, and that's just going to grow, you know, the more you do. And so we're just really looking forward to seeing, you know, where you're heading in the future. And, and thank you so much for, for, um, you know, just being a guiding light and the, the honest and an authentic guiding light, um, through sort of our life journey. So yeah, thanks for spending the time with us today. I appreciate the medium, the audience, and for sharing the message. And I hope in the future, it'll take me to Australia too, very soon. <laughs> for sure. Cool stuff. Cool. And then just uh, briefly from me, Sarah, I just wanted to say like a massive thank you. There's this kind of theme of, I, I feel like strength, which, which you have, and you've, you've kind of always had, um, it's, it's just kind of guided you in, in your life, you know, even in those tough moments or thing or times when it seemed like maybe you you weren't as strong you know uh, with your say your eating disorders but there was there was the strength that always kind of like kind of pushed you and 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 moved you forward and 
and this is still what goes on and carries you in your life, which is, which is really cool to see. But um, you also, you just got this epic story, but you've got this diversity to, to what you've done and what you've experienced. And it's kind of like manifested and nurtured itself into this, um, this epic offering that you have now, you know, like you have so much kind of wisdom that you can kind of draw on and you can uh, help people with, which is just, um, such an important thing. And I think it's, uh, it's great what you're doing. It's great how you do it. Uh, you speak super well. You're like, you're extremely succinct with, with your thoughts and within how you converse them. And I think that's an art within itself. So, um, it's been such a great chat. Honestly, like the time literally just flew. So, um, it was, it was really, really interesting. Thanks. Like Craig said, you know, for sharing the, um, the authentic raw side of everything. I think that's so important. And, um, yeah, just wishing you all the best with everything and, um, wherever that holiday trip is, I hope it's an awesome one. And, uh, yeah, thanks for coming on the ridiculously human podcast. I appreciate it. It's a passion and it's an honor. And I'm going to Breaking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging 